Good morning, folks. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As they say in Berlin, Guten Morgen. Amen. Good to have you. I'd like to welcome you to Temple. This is, uh, did you know that this is the day the Lord hath made? Amen. Rejoice and be glad in it. We just had Bible school, had a good Bible school, had outstanding attendance, and thankful for that. Folks watching by uh, internet right now, streaming, join in with us. You're welcome. We want you to be part of what's going on here. And then the one that makes the most difference, the one that really matters, the name that is above every name. If you'll invite him in, he'll come in. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord, folks. I just thank the good Lord for the opportunity to be back in his house. Brother B.J., would you lead us in prayer, please? have a, a uh, wedding shower this afternoon at 4 p 4 30 p.m at the fellowship hall up here for heather barnes and daniel barnhart about to be married thank the lord for that amen new family coming on um and that's at 4 30 and i tell you what folks if if you didn't bring your children to that bible school they really missed out on a lot those folks put their hearts and souls into that. I tell you, they worked. They worked hard. And the good Lord blessed. And we thank Him for it. Amen. If you would stand and get your All American Church hymnal, turn to page number 47. I would not be denied. choir up at this time. We'll be singing out of the folder, page 38, All That Will Come Sing.
Okay, stand, get your All American Church hymnal, we'll turn to page number 142. I feel like traveling on. Are you feeling like traveling on? I am. Folks, I'm done with this place. <laughs>
If you'd like to sing in the choir, come up and sing as unto the Lord. And visitors, you're always welcome to come and sing with us. Amen. Lord bless you. Be seated as the choir comes down. me we've got a lot of kids who want to quote scripture Amen. come on up let's let them quote the bible well, by the way you know bible school is uh, vacation bible schools to teach them the bible amen the biblios the book Verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. Amen. James 1, 19 and 20, let every man be swift to hear, so to speak, and so to wrath. For the wrath of man does not work at the righteousness of God. Amen. Good. Outstanding. You know, there's something about that that will stay in the heart. All right, let's have the ushers come up here. We'll take up the morning offering. It's brother, it's good to have brother Tekel back with us. This excursion out west. We're glad, glad to have you back, brother. Lead us in prayer. Would you do that?
Folks, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's beautiful. Uh, Caleb Wilson, John Wright, be singing for us this morning. Lined up here, all ready to go. All right. When I was a young teenager, about 15 years old, I got hooked, line and sinker, and became a uh, alcohol drinking, drug using sinner. I was a sinner to begin with, but started doing those things and got into that. My high school years were a, a daze. And at 19 years and old, I was weary and sad. You can, you can be a young man and be weary and sad, like you've been through a lot. And uh, I cried out to God. I, I stole the car, went out driving drunk, and called out to God. That's all I remember. I don't know how I got to that point. But I guess I had realized that things were not going well. So I cried out, and uh, God answered that prayer and sent, my, through my brother who had gotten saved in the military, he sent gospel tracts and uh, tapes and things with the gospel on them. And I listened to those, and I came to trust Jesus Christ as my Savior at 19 years old. I had a craving for pleasures, and... God took away, most for the most part, he took away those cravings for pleasures. From the day I got saved, I never had a desire to do drugs again. Amen. And uh, the alcohol took a few months, but I, I figured that out too, and he took that away. And so God took those things away. I know some people struggle with those things all their life, but by the grace of God, uh, I haven't struggled with those things. Um, Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which is contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And then in Psalm 103, verses 10 through 12, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as far, for as the high, heaven is high above the earth, so great is the mercy toward them that fear him. And as the preacher was preaching the last few weeks, several times, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. The old man is gone. The new man took its place. We still struggle with sin, but God has taken away some things and given us other things. And this song was written by James Rowe in the 1920s. I heard it in the 1980s when I got saved the first year, and I thought this must be a modern song. It sounds good, you know. It's a southern gospel song, and, and people sang it. But found out this guy... 1820s or 1920s, he wrote something that sounds very fresh and new to us. And this is called, a song is called Love Took It Away. Once I bore a burden great, I was weary and sad. But no more I bear its weight. I'm pardoned and glad. Love stain I go love took it away love took it away one wonderful day it made me free and lifted me in the light to stay love took it away one wonderful day Once a craving great had I for pleasures that stain. Now I pass those pleasures by, they tempt me in vain. I am under his control, rejoicing each day. Gone the burn. 
word and from my soul love took it away once my record was unclean my spirit was worn now my name on high is seen just as fair as the morn oh what happiness is mine with jesus i stay sin no more makes me repine love took it away love took it away one wonderful day it made me free and lifted me in the light to stay love took it away one wonderful day gone at last my sinful past love took it away gone at last my sinful past love took it away In the darkness we were waiting, without hope and without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes, to fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word, from a throne of endless glory, to a cradle.
Till that stone was moved for good For that lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who'd come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth of old Shall not kneel and shall not faint And by His blood and in His name In His freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Praise forever to the King of Kings. right we didn't now that you mention it well let's do that if you're visiting with us this morning first time would you raise your hand anybody all right some folks here folks back here all right we'll try to get a card to you folks back here where are you all from over here Pennsylvania good to have you good to have you good to have you some of my best friends in the Marine Corps from Pennsylvania Amen. yeah yes sir <laughs> yes sir <laughs> Sure does. Once a Marine, always a Marine. You know that? That's right, buddy. All right. Somebody else on this side? Yes. Where are you folks from? North Carolina. All right. Good to have you. All right. Somebody else on this side? Where? Where? Tennessee. Tennessee. All right. <laughs> I know where that place is. I ought to. All right. Well, good to have you. Anyone else with us first time today? Somebody's pointing to somebody up here. Yes. You all, you folks? South Carolina. South Carolina. All right. Well, good to have you. Folks, make yourself at home with us. We treat our, we try our best to treat our visitors with as much honor and respect as we possibly can. Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Song of Solomon, chapter 8, and verse number 6 this morning. The Song of Solomon, chapter number 8. We've uh, done a good bit of study in the Song of Solomon on Wednesday night. I'd like to invite you to come. Wednesday night, we kind of uh, set aside as a time of study, kind of like a Sunday school time when you study. There is a difference, even though you're preaching from the same book, there is a difference between teaching and preaching. Yes. And uh, so uh, on this uh, Wednesday night, we'll be dealing, we have been dealing with the Song of Solomon. Chapter number 8 of the Song of Solomon in verse number 6, the scripture says, Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death. Father, bless this word now. In thy name I pray. Amen. I call your attention to the word seal. A seal. That's important because the scripture has much to say about seals. The sealer, according to John chapter number 6 and verse 27, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So the Father has sealed the Son. He sealed him, of course, by identifying him 
And the greatest seal he put, we was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. We got into that this past Wednesday night. It's a remarkable study in the Bible to find the different places and the context of when he was identified as the Son of God. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, he is the Son of God. If you don't believe that, you're not a Christian. You may be a nice, moral, religious person, but you don't know the Lord. He's the Son of God. But the Bible tells us that God the Father is the one that does the sealing. The Apostle Paul opens up the book of Ephesians, written to the church at Ephesus, in chapter number 1, by making some powerful, powerful statements. And this gets into the doctrine of election. In chapter number 1, and verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. This is a summation of the whole New Testament doctrine as it relates to the calling, to the birth, to the sealing, and to the future of the church of God. And this is important. Don't ever let anybody tell you that election is not a Bible doctrine. It is a Bible doctrine. No question about that whatsoever. But who is the elect we're talking about here in chapter number one? When you look at it very carefully, you'll find out that he's talking to his bride. He's talking to the church of God. He's talking to the one that he called before the foundation of the world. The one that we go back to the Song of Solomon, chapter number 8 and verse number 6 that says, Set me as a seal upon thine heart. There is a special love between the Lord Jesus Christ and his bride that none other have. There is a calling upon the church of God that none other have. There's an election this day of grace right now where he calls the church of the living God. But hold on. Don't get ahead of me. You hear these hyper-Calvinists get up and tell you, oh, well then if you're not, if, if this, if this if, if you're not here, if you're not part of the elect, then, then you're finished. You're it. No, sir, that's not what this Bible says. This Bible is directed toward his bride. But the family of God is much bigger than his bride. He has a special relationship with his bride like none other. Never will he ever have a relationship in the future with any like he has with his bride. He has a love and relationship for his bride today that he has never had in the past for any whatsoever. She is unique, and according to the Song of Solomon, she is one, and she's the only one of her mother. So make no mistake about it today. If you are a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you were written down in the predestination, in the will, and the mind of Almighty God, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Who he chooses is his business. The way he chooses them is his business. When he chooses them is his business. Why he chooses them is his business. But chosen you are. He called you by the grace of God. And you are what you are because the hand of God reached out and touched your soul. And I say to God today, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift who reached into the dark of the dark to the lonely of the lonely and called me by his grace. I am what I am today by the grace of God and I will forever praise his holy name for the one who gave himself that I might be saved. Oh yes, oh yes. 
Set him as a seal upon thine heart. Amen. We'll talk more about that a little later on. So get a hold of the idea. There is no doubt whatsoever that election is a Bible doctrine. But the multitudes twist it, turn it, distort it, and pervert it, and mess up multitudes of people because of it. So the sealed in Ephesians chapter number 1 and verse number 3, 14 says, In whom you also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. He just told you that when he saved you, he put a seal on you, and that he's waiting until he comes to get you and thereby take the purchased possession. We have been bought with a price. We belong to him. We don't belong to ourselves. We belong to the one who bought us and paid for us. And by the way, he purchased you with his own precious blood. Amen. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, was the down payment and complete payment for us and all that we will ever be. My Bible says in Matthew chapter number three and verse 16, in Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. And lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And forever he was well pleased. Every word, every thought, every deed, every breath of life he drew was to the glory of God the Father and was in the will of God the Father. Christ was sealed because of what he was in himself. When the Holy Spirit came down and sealed him, this is what happens when he was baptized because the Bible says the Holy Ghost came upon him like he had never done before, like he never will do again, because he's the only one of his kind. And when the Holy Spirit came down, he did not fill him by measure. He completely and absolutely sealed the Son of the living God in such a way that nothing else could have ever been sealed because of who he was. But when I was saved in 1973, the Holy Spirit of God baptized me into the body of Christ and when I went into the body of Christ, he sealed me by the Holy Spirit. And he sealed me by the Holy Spirit because of who he is. Because I was put into him, not because of who I am. I'm worthy of nothing. The seal itself is the Holy Spirit. Make no mistake, Holy Spirit. Not unholy, holy, holy, holy. Kathos, kathos, kathos. Holy Barnea, separate Barnea. A spirit that is separate from all the spirits of this world. And my friend, you have seen the floodgates of hell open. You've seen a demonic horde come upon you like you've never known before. This world is rife right at this very moment with demonic spirits go running to and fro. They're here. They're everywhere. They're in this house this morning. They hate me. They hate you. They despise the truth. But thanks be unto God, the Holy Ghost indwells the believer. Amen. 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 Holy. Holy separate unto God. So therefore, the seal is the presence of the Holy Spirit. By having the Holy Spirit indwelling you, this is the earnest of your inheritance. This is God's down payment that his word is true and that he will, and that he will do exactly what he says he will. The Bible said in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, here in his love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. As he is now, as he is where he is. As he is, so are we in this world. We are the, the direct image and direct sons of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, when he arose from the dead and became the last Adam, he renewed us in the image that we were first made in, but it was even higher than that. We have been made in the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Remember, upon my heart. And my friend, not only have we been done that, has he done that for us, but he has written our name in the Lamb's book of life. And now we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. And now he has this. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called Baptist. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Aren't you so glad that some churches you go to, the minute you walk through the door, you hear Baptist. And you preach Baptist. And you talk about Baptist. And all you know is Baptist. Let me tell you something about your Baptist. If that's all you are, you'll never see the gates of glory. 
You'll never make it without the Lord Jesus Christ. So your church is Methodist. So you're Presbyterian. So you're Lutheran. So you're proud, proud of your denomination. You better get a hold of Christ. Your denomination won't get you anywhere. I'm not against the Baptist. I'm not against the Presbyterian. I'm not against any of them. But I am a Christian first. I am a believer in the Son of God. He wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. He means far more to me than any denomination. And that includes you Baptist briders. Amen. And that includes this crowd running around telling you that the only church that ever existed from the beginning was the Baptist church. Get out of that garbage. Those believers in the book of Acts, my dear friends, some of them couldn't understand half of what you worship today. And yet they knew our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And it took me 46 years of studying the Bible to look at that bunch and say, get back in your Bible and get on your knees and learn something from God. I was taught in a Bible college that unless you are a church of like faith and order, having a preacher of like faith and order, and you worship the Lord of like faith and order and the Lord's Supper and all this and that, then you have no right to baptize anybody. Have you ever heard that junk? And you, of course, cannot take of the Lord's Supper in our church because you're not of like faith and order. Garbage. If you're born of the Spirit of God, there's only one faith, one Lord, one baptism, and one body of Christ. Amen. Didn't mean to get off on all that, but that's okay. Lord, uh, put up with it. Amen. <laughs> Sealed by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that he is the Son of God. So are we sons of God. 1 John 3, 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father bestowed upon us. We should be called sons of God. Son of God. How did I, I become a son of God? Preacher, by the new birth. You are born of God. What's that mean? That means the Spirit of the living God. As he gave breath to the first Adam, he breathed the Spirit of God into you. And you're born of the Spirit of the Holy One. He is beloved of God. So are we. First John chapter number 3, it said, Behold, what manner of love the Father bestowed upon him. We should call it, Therefore he knoweth us not, because he knew him not. We are beloved. We are accepted in the beloved. He's the righteous one. So are we. Second Corinthians 5, 21, it says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray in Christ's stead you be reconciled to God. For it made him be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Oh, all that he has in store for those that love him. Don't ever re let religion rob you of your identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't ever let man put something in front of you that separates you from the love of Christ. Amen. Is he without spots or are we? Song Solomon chapter number four and verse seven. Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. When he says, my love, he's talking to her. When she says, my beloved, she's talking to him. He, did he die on the cross? So did we in him. The Bible said in Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that a old man is crucified when the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Yes, we're different. We're bought with a price. We're odd. We'll never fit in. Let me give you a fair warning this morning. If you've ever come by simple faith in Christ, you really believed in him, you accepted him as our brother's testimony. Wasn't that good? 19 years old, he got saved. Some of you had no idea what he's talking about, but I would that you do. I would like for you to meet him like he met him. I was 27 when I met him. I'd been in church, out of church, and in church, out of church. I didn't know the Lord, but I did in 1973 when I met him. And he made a complete change in my life. He took it out of here, and he put it down here. That's why some things move me. I sometimes anger wells up in my soul when I watch religion when religion begins to just dictate and motivate and direct and, and force and, and, and people. I hate it. I despise that garbage because the Bible said if the Son make you free, you're free indeed. You don't need a man on the face of this earth. You need Christ. Let me say it again. There's not a man breathing on this earth you need. You need Christ. Amen. And so does he, whoever the he might be. The Bible said in Ephesians 2, 6, and, and he is raised from among the dead. The Bible said he hath raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're accepted in the beloved, Ephesians 1, 6. Is he the Holy One? 
The Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse 2, unto the church of God, which is a Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, call to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both theirs and ours. Is he anointed of God? The Bible says in 1 John chapter number 2 and verse number 27, but the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you. But the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. Even as hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Here's what that means. If you get into a church that's man-made religion, that worships man, that's all about man, it's all about human achievement, it's all about you, 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 then my friend, if you'll do some serious praying, the Holy Ghost will get you out of that bunch. And here are the two things to identify a church by. Here they are. These are the two things that make all the difference in the world. Do they exalt the Lord Jesus Christ? If they exalt the Lord Jesus Christ in that place from their heart and their soul, the Holy Ghost is going to be there. And if you go into a church where the Holy Spirit is present, you're going to feel life the minute you walk through the door. There's going to be power in that place. People are going to be saved, delivered, healed. All the working of the Holy Spirit is going to be present. But first of all, the Lord Jesus Christ has got to be exalted and lifted up. And if he's not, the Holy Ghost will, won't put up with it. He'll leave. I don't care how orthodox. They can fill their walls with the greatest catechisms that men have ever made. Believe all the points of orthodoxy right down the line. But if they don't exalt Christ, they're dead. And the Holy Spirit won't put up with it. <laughs> so what does this seal imply? In the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 32, verses 9 through 15, is a wonderful story. And I'll try to move through it quickly for the sake of time. But here's what's going on. Jeremiah the prophet prophesied of a coming fall. Israel would no longer have a sovereign nation. They would be carried off into the hands of their enemies. And the people didn't like it. Their prophets didn't like it. They made all kinds of things to make a mockery of Jeremiah. And they didn't like it. They wound up throwing him into a pit. And, but Jeremiah was the man of God, and he was true to his word. Then the Lord came to Jeremiah, and he said, I'm going to show you something. And one of the men his, of his own family, of his own, his own clan, came to Jeremiah and said, I'll tell you what, Jeremiah, I've got a piece of land that I'll sell you. Now, why sell him a piece of land when you know you're getting ready to be carried off? I mean, here, here's an underhanded deal if there ever was one. I'm going to sell you something that I can't hold on to myself. Hey, here, Jeremiah, but because you're of the near a kin, uh, you go ahead and buy it from me. You know what? God said, Jeremiah, buy it. Buy it. And you know what Jeremiah did? He bought it. And he gave him the price. And he set a seal on it. And God said, let me tell you what's going to happen now. This piece of land that you bought, even though you may be carried off into captivity, the day is going to come when you come back into this land and that property is going to be yours. In plainer words, you're showing by buying this your faith in God's ability to fulfill his promise. And he did fulfill his promise. And they called the witnesses and they set a seal on it. And let me tell you, folks, bring it up to today. There's a lot of people, I mean a lot of church people, they've just given over to the culture. They quit fighting. Oh, where's your temper? When are you going to get mad? When's it going to bother you? They're taking your kids. When are you going to do something about it? Did you know <coughs> that they had a homosexual, uh, transgender, Budweiser did get on a can of beer? You see that can of beer with Budweiser? Well, this, this woman, is, a man became a woman and all that. And did you see what happened? The beer drinkers got mad. The beer drinkers did more to affect the culture of this country than the churches do. Oh, God help us. Am I telling you the truth? That ought to, that ought to shame us. The beer drinkers. And probably half the church here is full of beer drinkers. <laughs> Let me tell <laughs> Lord, they're going to run me off, brother. <laughs> I'm, I'm gone. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, 
drinking beer doesn't send anybody to hell. What sends you to hell? <laughs> Calling God a liar. Rejecting the record God wrote of his son. That's the issue. That's the issue. Deal with the issues. And you'll find out what makes a man right with God. But anyway, I thought I'd just drop that in so you kind of get an idea of what's going on in the culture today. Uh, you can put more stock in beer directors than you can in most of these church people. They've sat on their duff now for 50 years, and all they've done is nod their little head and done nothing, and the country, country's gone to hell all around them. How many agree with what I've said? Amen. <laughs> Amen. They've, they, that's what's happened. Well, this is what happened here. They think they're going to carry us off. It's going to be over. Church is useless. It's wasted. But no, it's not because he's going to come and take us. He's going to get us. He's going to catch us up to meet him. And I don't know if it's going to happen in my lifetime. Or I'm going to keep looking for him regardless. Why? He sealed me. He owns me. And I'm looking for the coming of the Lord. Now, another purpose of seal is uh, for security. You know what they did with a dead man, don't you? They put a dead man's dead body in a tomb, rolled a stone, big stone, rolled it in front of it. Then they set a watch. They sealed him in that tomb. The Pharisees weren't the only ones wanting to keep him in the tomb. The Romans wanted to keep him there. The Herods wanted to keep him there. The religion of the day wanted to keep him there. And the religions of this day want to keep him there. Every last one of them. Why? Because when a man rises from the dead, it proves he's got power that none of the rest of them have. And death, my dear friends, is a curse. And therefore, he broke the power of the curse. And he came forth blessed of God. And then he said in the book of Revelation, chapter number one, John, he said, because I live, ye shall live also. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. And then I have the keys of death and hell. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. The tomb, for security, he seals us. So I belong to him. You think Satan doesn't know that? You think Satan doesn't know I belong to the Lord? You think he doesn't, you think he doesn't come try to rip me apart, tear me all to pieces? This past week, I've had two or three dear preachers on my heart, pastors, ministers. They've gone through, some of them are going through pure hell right now. One of them has gone through a horrible time. And God's moved on my soul to try to pray for them, pray for them, and try to help them. Let me tell you something. Now, I've learned this for a long time, folks. It took me a long time to get here. There's no perfect pastor. There's no such thing. If your church is looking for a perfect pastor, and I'm talking to somebody out there that may be listening, then you're a bunch of hypocrites. I'll just be plain and straight to the point. You're a hypocrite. There is no such thing as a perfect pastor. And I'm going to tell you something else. If something starts in the church, trouble starts in the church, or something of that nature... Unless that pastor is just openly fornicating and a low-down piece of garbage, I'm going to take that pastor's side. I'm going to take that pastor's side against the Sanhedrin or whatever else rises up in that church against him. I'll take that pastor's side. Do you know why? Because I, I know what pastors live. I know what they go through. I know how, what they have to deal with. I understand the pressures they're under. I understand the, 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 the diatrophies and the crowd like that that can come against them. And there's a pastor on my heart right now that's going through something like that. And you don't need to know his name, but just pray for him. Pray for his, his wife's bawling her eyes out. She's up at night, can't sleep, crying. You know, and I mean, you may have all kinds of ministries going and all kinds of stuff going, and that's all grand. But folks, it's that walk with the Lord and Satan wants to destroy it. And you'll find out, too, when this happens, when stuff like this happens, you'll find out who loves you. You'll find out who supports you. And, and this brother will. He and his wife will. They'll find out who, who loves them and who will support them. And I want to tell you who will love them and support them. It'll be the people in that church that face reality and live in the real world. And they know they got problems, too. And they know that they've had issues come up. And I don't know the point. I don't know any of the details about anything. I just know this. I'm pro-pastor unless I have an absolute reason not to be. How many of you are like that? Amen. Amen. The Bible said, you that are spiritual, restore such an one. And I'm not saying the pastor needs to be restored, but restore such an one. One that fills up the breach. One that helps each other. One that prays for each other. 
Is this a church that if I, if, I, if I come up in front of this church and ask you to pray for my family, that my family's going through a, through, a, through a trying time like it hadn't gone through in decades? Is there anybody in here that say, well, I'm going to pray for that pastor's family? Well, I've asked you to do that. God knows I've asked you to do that. I've asked you to do that more than once, friends. I'm not playing. <laughs> I've asked you, please pray for my family. We're going through an assault like you wouldn't believe. But what am I going to do? I'm going to get up here and I'm going to preach God's word and I'm going to look a devil right in the eye and I'm going to tell him God called me to preach and I've told the Lord, I said, Lord, use me until I'm done. When you're finished with me, take me home. Fight the good fight of faith. Amen. Amen. So the Father has sealed us with the Holy Spirit. Now I'll close with what I'm going to give you here. And I think this is a beautiful thing. I like beauty, don't you? I love beauty. I walk by the flowers and I look at them and I think, who did God make those flowers for? You can always tell when day breaks, the birds start singing. How many noticed that? You ever wondered why God made music? You look at the notes of a scale. I mean, for somebody that can't die, I mean, I am dead in the water when it comes to it, but I love it. I listen to music all the time. And I can sit down and enjoy beauty. I love art. I love that stuff. You either do or you don't. I do. I love beauty. I love to see beauty. The Father has sealed you with the Holy Spirit. That means we belong to him. Satan no longer has a legal claim on us. Amen. That was settled at the cross. The ancient world had what's called a bulle, if I'm pronouncing the word correctly, B-U-L-L-A-E. In other words, the sovereign or a high official would wear a ring, a ring with a signet on that ring, big enough to impress in clay. This is the way they did it. They would roll up a document, some important thing, and then they put the clay to it, and he would press his ring into that. So what that mean? That meant that if you broke that, they're going to hang you. That's what that means. That means that you violated the sovereignty of a king or a queen. That means that there's something going on here that absolutely must be honored. That's what that's for. Sealed. Did you know that they have found pieces of bule over there in Israel by the thousands? All over the place. Because it's a common thing. All the documents and so much of this, you know, it's common. And they have found the name of Hezekiah on one of those just recently. How many of you know who Hezekiah is? Straight out of the book. <laughs> Did you know they have found countless bule that are associated with Jeremiah, the prophet? Everywhere, all over the place. The rocks are crying out about him. Yeah, everywhere. It's almost like God has accelerated what they're finding today. They're finding it. They found the bone box, the ossuary. Remember the bone box? You remember whose bone box it was? That's exactly right. Caiaphas, and it was an important bone box. It had, it had engraving on it and all of that. But, of course, it was Caiaphas' bone box. They couldn't find a bone box of the Lord. You know why? No bones to box. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> the only thing they could find was an empty tomb. Yeah. Amen. Amen. But they sure found Caiaphas, and they found Hezekiah's bully. They found Jeremiah and all so many others for the sake of time. I can't get into all of them. But it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Just type the word into, 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 into the internet. 2,700-year-old seal impression bearing the name of Hezekiah has been discovered in the excavations of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Isn't that beautiful? Think about that. Somebody said, well, I don't believe the Bible. Yeah, well, you if you're that ignorant, don't say it out loud. You know, kind of, kind, of, kind of be quiet about it. Now let's go back to the Song of Solomon. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death. If you look at the context of that, it's kind of hard to figure out who's talking to who here. But it may be that the Holy Spirit wants it that way. Sometimes the Lord has a purpose in kind of making things a little foggy because he can speak two different ways it's a beautiful thing let's say that's the Shulamite talking and the Shulamite says to her love um, 
put my picture and me on your heart. And then when you do, seal out everything else. All the daughters of Jerusalem, all of the rest of them, I'm yours and you're mine and nobody else. Or it could be him talking to her and saying, and saying to her, put me on your heart. Put me on your heart. Seal out everything and let your whole life be dedicated with your love for me. In other words, he loves her. She loves him. This culture today is so perverted that they think when you use the word love, you speak of weakness. No, you don't. They don't know what love is. Amen. When you, If you have self-love, you've blinded yourself to every other love. Amen. Let's put it that way. It'd be as simple as I know how to say it. No, they don't know what love is. But if you have the love that is strong as death, then you're talking about saying to the Lord Jesus, put me on your heart, seal me in there. I'm yours. There's only one of us. And you know what? There is. Do you understand what it's saying here to you this morning? I'm saying this to you. I'm saying that you, for 2,000 years, he's been building his body of Christ, his church, his bride, and that you are on his heart in a way that the Old Testament saints were not, that the tribulation saints will not be, that the millennial saints will not be, that any other of the house of God will not be. You'll have a special place. Now, in Ephesians chapter number one, in the fullness of the dispensation of the fullness of time, the Bible says he's going to gather together in Christ all. The time's going to come when all of the family of God will be put into Christ, but it does not say they're all the bride. The bride is one. That's you. This is what this election is about that we started with. You're special to him. He ought to be special to you. Amen. If the Holy Ghost is in you right now, 2023, right now in the age of grace, if the Holy Spirit is in you, he is trying to build a yearning in you, not for yourself, not for righteousness, not for holiness, not for goodness. He's trying to build a hunger in you for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the answer to every holiness, faith, your life, everything it is. He's it. He's all we need. And he's everything we need. Do you have that? Do you have that? You say, preacher, I've tried to live for the Lord. I've rededicated my life. That's all a good term, but, but it's, it really is it's kind of a shallow term. Say, I've rededicated. Rededicated what? To what? That's not really saying a whole lot. But if you say, Lord Jesus, I hunger for you. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so my heart panteth after thee. The psalmist said, do you hunger for him? I want to know more about him. I want him to fill my days. I want to be so full of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be so full of thinking about him that death and sorrow, suffering, dying and crying and all the pain of this world could just kind of fades away. He's not going to take you out of it till he comes to take you out of it. But you don't have to focus your life on it. You don't have to live in death. You can live in your walk with the Lord Jesus. You want that? You can have that if you know him. And then, of course, if you'll come back and study with me in 1 John where it says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses, is cleansing, constantly cleansing, present tense, cleansing us from all sin. That's the fellowship. You have to have it. Father, bless your word. Thank you for the time together. There may be somebody in the house this morning who, Lord, who really, 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 they've tried everything else. They've tried it all. They've rededicated their lives. They've turned over new leaves. They've made commitments to God. They've made promises to the Lord. But when they did all of that, they really didn't know where to turn to. They didn't know what, what source to tap into. They really didn't understand what the spiritual battle was about. They never were really focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, who is beautiful and beyond the wildest imagination, the Son of God. Lord Jesus, may we lift thee up this morning. May I decrease and may you increase. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. May you increase and may I decrease. In thy blessed name I pray. Heads about. What do you...
I'm inviting you to come this morning. I really am. And say, Lord Jesus, you know, I'm kind of tired of my spiritual life, my Christian life. It's really not what I expected it to be. I had that initial joy when I first got saved and, and rejoiced. And I know I'm changed. I know I'm saved. But my life hasn't been in. It just really hadn't had any joy in it. And I haven't had any victory. And I, I get blown from one place to the next place. And I'm hunting this and hunting that and trying this and trying that. But you're the only one in this house today that who can really say whether you've got peace in your soul or not. And that peace comes from the Holy Ghost. And that peace will be yours if you're walking with him, if you love him, if you focus in your mind upon him. Have you noticed it's not about, it's not about me, it's not about the church, it's not about the ministry, it's about Christ. Do you love him? Do you love him? Have you ever told him you love him? Have you ever thought about his cross? Have you ever thought about how he suffered for you? Have you ever thought about the battle he went into? You understand that, don't you? You understand he went into a battle on the cross, not only the flesh, but spiritually. You understand all that. You understand how he loves you now at the right hand of the Father. Do you really think about that? Fanny Crosby says, I think of him all the day long, and I don't doubt that for a moment. I don't think anybody in this world ever loved him more than Fanny Crosby. She loved him. She loved the Lord Jesus. She had to, to write the kind of songs she did and the words. Had a message in it. Speaks from the heart. Would you like to be with me down here? And I'll get down here and pray with everybody if you want to. If anybody wants to come. I'll be glad to. Want to. We'll get down here and we'll pray. I want to talk to the Lord. I want to get closer to him this morning than I was when I started. I want to love him more than I did when I walked through that door. I want the Lord Jesus Christ to absolutely possess every thought of my mind, every part of my being. I want the Lord Jesus Christ to be everything there is to be to me. Because I know him, but I also know there's much, much, much more to know about him. I'm going to get out here and we're going to pray. Anybody want to come pray with me? Anybody? We'll give you a moment to come down and we'll pray. We'll talk to the Lord. I got to. I can't make it without him. I can't do it. I don't know about you, but I failed so fast it'd make your head swim. I revert back to the old man, start grappling, complaining, seeing nothing but problems and trouble instead of seeing the answer. Yeah, we're going to pray. Yeah, we're going to pray. Father, thank you. You laid a calling on my life. This is what I live for, Lord. There's no struggle. You know that. No struggle. I'm happy. I'm fulfilled. I rejoice in the calling you've given me. You've given me a good life. You've blessed me. You saved me. You called me by your grace. Lord, I've rebelled against you at times. I sure have. I've rebelled against you. I've turned my own way. Oh, yeah, I can still put on a religious show, a professional religion. Oh, yeah. Any preacher's been at it long enough, he can do that too. Sure. But my Heavenly Father, you know my heart. You know my soul. I love you. I love you with all my soul. I love you with all my heart. I give you my life this morning, Lord Jesus. Thank you for that cross. Thank you for what you did for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. I can't, understand, I can't even begin to understand how you suffered on that tree. I can't, but I know one thing. I know you loved me, and I know that you had to die to pay the sin debt. I know that, and I know my Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for the, I pray, I pray so much today that the Lord Jesus Christ becomes so real to me in ways that I've never known him before. There's so much to him. There's so much more to him that we can even imagine and the only way we're going to know it is when you let us know, when you bring him to us, when you bring him alive to us. The Holy Ghost will do that. I pray for the folks that have come this morning to pray. And they're on their knees. They're talking to you. Father, maybe some of them, they need to confess some sin. I just did. There's more to confess. My goodness gracious. I could spend a day confessing sin. But Lord Jesus, I need to come out of it. I need some, I need some power. I need, I, need, I, need, I need the grace of God. I want to live for you. I want to walk with you. And I pray for them. I pray. If there's somebody in the house this morning beat to death, they know it. They know they've given in, and now they're paying the price. 
Oh, don't let Satan destroy them. Don't let him, don't let him tear their faith down and fill their heart with no hope. Let them know regardless of how far they've gone that the blood of Christ can cleanse from all sin and that you're faithful and just, that you can restore them, that they can be restored, that they can come home, that they can shout again, that they can rejoice, they can read their Bible, they can feel, they can feel something jumping up and down inside their soul. It may, have lay, it may have lain dormant for a long time, but it's still there. It's still there. Holy Ghost has never left us. Bless them. Father, I pray for a filling this morning. There may be somebody in here that's, they're hungry. They're, they, they want to be full. They want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You said to be not drunk with wine where is in excess, but be filled, and I believe that. Oh, yes. Fill them. Forgive them. Cleanse them. Restore them. God, raise them up, Lord. Let them walk out of here and walk out of here rejoicing that they've been brought back. That there's nothing between, not a thing. There's nothing between. Bless them now. We bless thee. I bless you because you blessed me. I speak to you because you spoke to me first. And I'll forever, I don't know how long I'll be here, Lord, but my life's in your hands. I tell you that every day. My life is in your hands. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We've got Brother Tom Harning, H-A-R-N-I-N-G, Harrington. Oh, two R's. Brother Tom Harrington, he's coming as a candidate for baptism. And he wants to unite with the fellowship of this assembly. Do you have anything you'd like to say to the people? Turn, if you want to, you can come up here. That's fine, whatever. I've been truly blessed the last five Sundays when I've worshiped with you. You were very encouraging to me, and I feel very lifted up when I visit and worship with you. God bless and keep each and every one of you. Amen. Thank you, brothers. Amen. All right. <laughs> What's the pleasure of this assembly by receiving him as a candidate for baptism? Motion's made. Motion seconded. Those in favor show by lifting the right hand. Well, brother, we're going to baptize. Amen. And then we'll get together with you and set a date and... You may have family and friends that you'd like to invite, so we'll talk to you about that. All right, Amen. Would you? <clears throat> we'd like to. Uh, we'd we'd like for you to come back down the front, though. We'd like to shake hands with you, and give you the right hand of church fellowship. We do a lot of shaking hands when people join the church, Amen. and uh, we're just glad that you're here, and that that God gave you something. Amen. That's a big deal. All right. Okay. Let's stand up, and let's pray. Set me as a seal upon thine heart. Oh, yeah. Brother Barry McDonald, will you dismiss us, please? <laughs>